I mean, occasionally you can create extraordinary curiosity by seemingly breaking the rules of a conventional narrative. So the Red Wedding in Game of Thrones, where you know, sort of half the principal characters are suddenly killed, for example. Or you have you know, Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, where the title character is dead pretty early on in the whole, in the whole action. But some sort of curiosity, certainly if you want to create one of those long-running sagas, you either have to create the cliffhanger ending, as Dickens, who was, of course, publishing in serial form, was an absolute master of that. Uh, you know, Netflix has to understand how to do that if it's going to get us to sit down, you know, for four and a half hours in a pool of our own urine, uh, watching, you know, watching a film more or less until the, the early hours of the morning. I've had those Netflix moments where you suddenly realise the birds have started singing, and you go, oh shit. I've really overdone this. But that's the kind of, you know, fantastic thing you can do to keep people hooked. And it's, I think there's an important question here about the trade-off, which is you have to have a degree of unresolved tension or a degree of uncertainty. Obviously, all crime drama has a wonderful whodunit narrative structure, uh, which um, uh, keeps people hooked. Uh, Hitchcock was brilliant on the difference between uh, fear and suspense. I think, I think the difference is, you know, if a bomb goes off, it's frightening. If you have a couple in a car and you know there's a bomb ticking away in the boot, you've actually got them frightened for 10 minutes rather than 10 seconds. And so understanding that sort of unresolved tension um, is really interesting because you have to leave a certain amount unexplained. On the other hand, you know, you can take that to an extreme where... Uh, you lose the audience completely. And that, that's, I think that's partly where the balance lies. It's, it's um, leaving enough unexplained or enough throwing enough mystery in to keep someone wanting more, while at the same time there's an, equal, there's an opposite danger, which is you lose people completely. In other words, their level of comprehension is now so low that they're no longer invested in the story and they don't care. So, you know, if you watch again, I'm, I, you know, I'm a fan, strangely, of French art house. No one expects me to be a fan of French art house. I don't like their cheese, but I kind of like their cinema. And, um, but, you know, there are those sort of Rob Grier films from the late 60s, which are basically, you know, when a, when a completely strange character walks in and appears to have nothing to do with the main narrative several times, after about the fourth occasion, you kind of lose, well, literally, you lose the plot. But the, the vital thing is you have to, it's that old phrase, isn't it, which is when you're baiting a, 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 a mouse trap, be sure to leave enough room for the mouse. And so that business where the person themselves, the, the viewer, is actually desperately trying to contribute part of the narrative uh, as part of the sense-making drive seems to me a vitally important part in keeping people engaged for more than a certain amount of time. Great, great advertising often starts with something that doesn't appear to make sense. You know, you've immediately got someone's attention. It's the old journalistic trope of, you know, dog bites man is not a story, man bites dog is a story. And if you can start with something which, you know, no one's seen before and which appears to be completely incongruous and then make sense of it, that's a brilliant way of holding the attention.